Good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing? I still hear the radio in my head. Now I don't. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, it's great to see some of you back from the cruise. And uh, feel free to quarantine in the corner over there. Um, I, all of our folks in the buffet line, we've started. Buffet line's closed. Let's stand together as we sing this great hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. One, two, three. seat at this time. Good morning, everybody. I am grateful to see all of you. I hope you're grateful to be here. I, I see uh, some of you probably stayed up a little late last night watching the football game, um, but at least they uh, decided to pull it out. I gave up around the middle of the fourth, uh, about the first part of the fourth quarter, because I was just too tired. But uh, anyway, it looks like they pulled it out. I'm also glad, grateful to see those of you who have just come back from Alaska. I'm especially grateful because you seem to have brought a cold front with you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my goodness, that was, that was nice to have about an inch of rain yesterday. Yes, so let's keep praying that God will send about, we need about 20 more, yeah. um, truth be told. So... Well, God certainly is our king, as we just sang about, and we're going to talk about and sing about and learn about more his majesty and sovereignty 
and our calling to be in allegiance to him today. If you're new here, I'm Pastor James. We welcome all of you. We uh, ask that if you are a guest here today, you fill out a guest information card that's in the Bible rack right in front of you. Or you can fill out uh, an online form at westoakwoods.com slash connect, or you can use the uh, QR code there on the screen. Today as we pray and as we welcome God's Spirit into our worship time together, let's be mindful that uh, everyone gathered here and worshiping with us has dealt with probably some hard realities this week. We are all going through something, or we know somebody who is. And so we take this time out now to welcome God's Spirit to comfort, to encourage, to convict, and to equip us to meet the challenges of our day. Let's pray together. God, we seek your guidance today. Lord, we all individually come into this time of worship, either on site or online, all with a myriad of different things that uh, are spinning in our minds and hearts, responsibilities we have, obligations, perhaps to work, family, school, etc., We're all facing tensions in our lives. Even the attention that we'll talk about today, Lord, in that which exists between our flesh and your spirit. So, Lord, help us to walk today and to learn to walk more effectively according to your spirit's guidance. We pray, Lord, for encouragement. We pray for patience. We pray that today would be a day that uh, if we're struggling with decisions that need to be made in our lives, that we would come to a peaceful resolution. Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with illness. The latest wave of COVID. Those who are suffering because of natural disasters. We pray for your spirit to lead, to guide, to help. Because we recognize, Lord, you are our advocate, our helper, and our friend. And you never leave us and never forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that you are our King and our Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This next hymn we're going to sing, you'll find a common thread throughout each of the verses, is penned by Charles Wesley. And... um... If you know much about the Methodist theology, there's this idea that we are continually being perfected by the Holy Spirit, that we're continuing to be molded. And it's not just a one time, um, uh, I invite the Spirit into my life and He's there and that's it, but it's a continual indwelling toward this idea of perfection. And where Baptist and Methodist may differ a little bit is, uh, at least in the way Wesley expressed it, you could achieve that perfection in this world, basically. That was the goal, was to achieve that perfection through the Spirit. Uh, we, we believe that we're not perfect until we've been taken up uh, and, and God is fully expressed through us. But the sentiment of the song is the same, that we are requesting, we are seeking that God's Spirit indwell us. Let's stand together as we sing, Love Divine, a Love Excelling. <laughs> Good run 
nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are well Flood this place and feel the atmosphere. Your glory, Lord, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your Nothing worth more that will ever come close. You now can compare. You're our living hope in your presence. Lord. Holy Spirit, you are. And feel the atmosphere. Your glory, Lord, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more And feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Be seated. Brian. I'll be reading this morning from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we, we see slavery as, a, as a, a word we don't like to use anymore, but we ask you to help us to become more slaves of righteousness and more of an outreach into our community because they can see that we have grace and not be slaves to sin and to the law. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. children, you hear your children, 
you are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then. You answered prayers back now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then, and you're providing now. You are the same God. You are the same. Not 
not my strength when yours alone nothing else but you oh Lord I find everything in you not my will but yours this morning of who you are, the God who's worthy of surrendering all because everything in this world is temporal. It goes away. But God, you are everlasting, the same God of Jacob and Mary and David, the same God that we worship today. The things that we worry about here in this world, they, they go away. The fears that we have are minor in your eyes. And yet you support and love us through all of it. We pray in your name as we hear from your word this morning. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. On these September Sundays, we are learning about the Holy Spirit. He's our advocate. He is our friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is... The very spirit of Jesus himself and lives in the soul of every believer. And so continuing in that theme, today we're going to speak on the topic, the subject, using your base of operations. How are you using your base of operations? I would invite you to turn with me to Galatians this morning. Chapter 5, Galatians 5, verses 13 through 26. Galatians 5, 13 through 26. This, of course, is Paul writing. He says, for you, now he's talking to the group, this is a plural you, means y'all. You all. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are 
evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, and envying one another. What a passage. Let's pray together. God, we thank You for such a wonderful, loaded passage as this. Lord, we thank You today that we're not just dealing with spiritual milk. We're dealing with spiritual meat. And I pray that we would feed well on this this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There are about a month's worth of Sundays of preaching that I could get out of this passage. Um, I won't give you a whole month's worth this morning. But what I want to do is get at this, this certain passage in two particular ways. We're going to look at, first of all, the theological, and then we're going to connect that with the practical. Pretty simple if you think about it. The, the theological always should be connected with the practical. So let's deal with the theological first and then with the practical. So first the theological. There's a fantastic term that Paul uses in this passage that really sets the tone for the entire text. The word, the term, happens in verse 13, and I never really caught this, to be honest with you, until the Holy Spirit just lit it up for me in my study this week. It's in verse 13, and I think we have that on the screen here. We do. It says, do not turn, now that word means twist or pervert, don't twist your freedom into an, here's the word, opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Let me tell you about this word opportunity. This is the theological part of the sermon here. The word opportunity, as Paul uses it here, means base of operations. Now, you may say, James, big whoop. But to me, this is fantastic. Let me tell you why. Every one of us, every single one of us, has a base of operations, a control room in the mind. It's Coach Sark's office. The UT film room that they're probably in this morning, right? Have you ever seen the movie Inside Out? That is a great animated movie. If you haven't seen it, please go watch it. It's not just for kids. It's an everybody movie. But the, the, the story follows this young lady who has anger and joy and uh, what are the other characters? disgust and other some of you kids sadness. sadness jack knows that one that are pulling levers and pushing buttons in the mind the control that is your base of operations in paul's thinking opportunity for us opportunity is not just some freewheeling choice we make because we have a perceived advantage at something this is an opportunity. No. 
For Paul, our opportunity in life deals with how we handle the levers and the pulleys in our minds and our hearts. Am I making sense? Paul clearly says here that we should be very aware that we can use our base of operations, the levers and the buttons in our brains, we can use these things in ways that twist and pervert the good things of God. It's possible for us to take the freedom that God has given us through Christ and forgiveness of sin. It's possible for us to twist that freedom in ways that please the flesh. For instance, we can say, well, since I have grace, since I have freedom in Christ, since I have forgiveness, I can just go live it up. I can live like the devil on Saturday and find some consolation in church on Sunday. Is that a good way to use your base of operations? Just like God called the Hebrews out of bondage in Egypt and set them free to be a holy people, God has called us out of bondage to sin and through Christ has set us free to be his holy people. And he has set us free not to do what we want, but free to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We are not free to use grace as a license to do what we want. We are to utilize grace to do what God wants. Christian freedom, friends, doesn't tell you what to do. It tells you what you can do. As a pastor, I'm not up here to tell you what to do every Sunday. Praise be to God for that. Do you know what I'm saying? I am not a guru. I don't want to be. I didn't even sleep at a Holiday Inn last night, you know? I tell you what you get to do through the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. And there's no law and no ceremony and no technology that can contain that. The one who is truly free is the one who trusts that God will open up the Red Sea. There was no law and no ceremony performed that got the Hebrews through the Red Sea. It's all grace. Don't let anything lasso you away from your freedom in Christ and using your mind and your heart for what he wants. Are y'all hanging with me? Okay. That's the theological part. Let's make it practical. In fact, there are two options that Paul lays out on the table here for how we can function in our freedom in Christ and use our base of operations. There's two choices. One option is really, really bad, but we're going to talk about it. And one option is really, really good for how you put this Christian freedom into practice. So let's start with the bad one first. Are you ready? Let's do the bad news first. It is an option. Option number one is this. You can use your Christian freedom for your flesh. You can utilize your base of operations just to do what you want. Your flesh. In fact, Paul calls the word flesh. In the Greek, it's called sarks. Doesn't that even sound bad? Your sarks. That's your flesh. 
The term refers to that reality in our lives that's totally opposed to the things of God. The flesh is that voice in your mind, that compulsion that we all have. We all have it. It's that compulsion to do what we want instead of what God wants. Do you all ever struggle with that? Okay, I'm seeing a few people nodding up and down. That means yes, so I'm grateful to see that because I know I'm not by myself. Your flesh is not your human nature, but it is sure an infection of it. It's a Trojan horse that has gotten in your operating system. It's a virus. It's that thing inside of us that's in constant tension and even argument with the Spirit of God. I want to do this my way. The choice is yours and mine on how we are going to respond to that compulsion. You can twist your freedom in your base of operations to follow that voice or not to. And Paul warns us about it. If you do make this choice, there will be consequences. Y'all do know that, right? When you make a choice, there are consequences. I think we need to probably stop down and preach a whole lot more on that at some point, and I'll get to there at some Sunday or maybe a month of Sundays. But there are consequences to our choices. And Paul talks about the consequences of following your flesh. He says one thing that's going to happen is that you will start to bite and devour each other if you follow your flesh. The picture here is of animals sparring. Today we would say something like, they're fighting like cats and dogs. If you go with the flesh, just doing your own thing, you are going to start acting like snakes. Y'all are quiet this morning. (laughs) Man. When we start to bite and devour each other, that means we are choosing the flesh and not the spirit. And Paul says, listen, you can choose that option, but the consequence of of biting and dividing and devouring each other is you may find yourself with nothing left. You're going to chew each other to death. And when that happens in the church, friends, holy moly, you might as well just put the for sale sign on the door and lock the doors. There's another thing that happens when you choose option one. Paul talks about it in verse 16. He says that the flesh has a certain kind of a desire attached to it. The word Paul uses for desire is the word lust. Uh Uh-oh. Can we talk about that in church? I don't know. If we choose to go with the flesh, there is something called a lustful craving. Now, this has to do, yes, with sexuality, but it's much more than that. Let me describe lust to you. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve saw the fruit of the tree and the serpent lied to them. And they both said, man, that fruit looks really good. If we eat that, we can be like God. We can have our own power. We'll never die. We'll be intellectually respectable. We will be financially profitable. We can have our truth over God's. We can revel in our superiority over everybody else. We will be sexually uninhibited. Let's eat. Friends, that's lust. It's the craving that's set in direct opposition to what God's Spirit wants for you. 
But here's some good news about this option. It is really easy to see how the flesh works. Paul says it's obvious. If you ever have a question, am I operating in the spirit or am I operating in the flesh? It is easy to tell the difference. Paul gives us a whole list. (laughs) Did you notice his list? He says the works of the flesh are plain as day. There's sexual immorality. The word he uses there is porneia. We get our word pornography from that word. It's a perverting of God's sexual gift for the satisfaction of our own egos. Surely that doesn't happen today. There's impurity. That's using sex as a weapon. There's sensuality. That word means shocking sexual behavior. Whoa. There's idolatry. There's something Paul calls sorcery. The word he uses there is pharmakeia. We get our word pharmacy from that. Pharmacies are good things, right? But what Paul's talking about is the mixing of chemicals to get high. Drug use. There's arguing and factions and excessive drinking and drunken parties and holding grudges. And Paul just stops this big list and says, everything like that is of the flesh. My goodness, friends. You know that it's time to do something different when those kinds of things have become part and parcel of your base of operation. That's a bad option, isn't it? Let's talk about something good. I'm ready for something positive. We get that here. Option two. Much better than option one. What is option two for using your Christian freedom out of your base of operations? Option two is this. Use your Christian freedom for the Holy Spirit. More specifically, Paul phrases it like this, walk in the Spirit. He says it numerous times in the passage, walk in the Spirit, live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. It all means the same thing. But let me explain it. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? The picture that Paul has here is kind of like this. You're so in tune with the Spirit of God and what He's saying that the Spirit literally grabs this leg and goes, and then He takes this leg. You're walking by the Spirit. Have you ever thought of walking your daily life like that? Here's the Spirit of God taking my legs and moving them one step at a time forward. Do you think that the Spirit of God is going to let you walk into the things of the flesh? No, He is not. Walk by the Spirit. Well, how do I do that? At this point, you can pray something like this. Holy Spirit, Direct my steps. Give me wisdom. I feel the compulsion. I feel the tension between you and the flesh. Help me to follow you. And you can trust, friends, that the Spirit will take you through the parted Red Sea. And after a while, as the Spirit has led you one step after another, you take a bunch of steps, and you're walking, and then you're running according to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit can take your feet and move them. 
And with, when that happens, it comes with a guarantee. You can take it to the bank. When you walk by the Spirit, Paul says you will never. In fact, there's a bunch of negatives lined up. We would say not, no, never, never. You will never, if you're walking according to the Spirit, please your lustful cravings in the flesh. Never. In fact, the Spirit is going to produce something totally opposite of that fleshly list. Things like love. Agape love. This is not rom-com love, right? You ever seen a romantic comedy? Everything just turns out okay in the end and they walk off like, all, oh, I love you. That's not it. This is sacrificial, get your hands dirty, Jesus on the cross love. And there's joy. The kind of joy that comes not by doing something. This is joy that's a gift that you celebrate. You don't earn it. You don't do anything. You don't buy anything to get this joy. It comes by the Spirit. There's peace, which is well-being. You're not at each other's throats all the time. There's patience. The word Paul uses there is long-suffering. It means to take a deep breath. Have you ever had somebody get on your nerves so bad? But the Spirit says, just breathe. Kindness. Man, we need that on 290 and 35. Goodness. This is a word that means we don't give ourselves over to our pride and over-sexualization of everything. It's goodness. Our world could use a dose of goodness right now. Why does everything have to be about me and my pride and my overt sexual proclivities? That's not good. There's faithfulness. This is belief in God that's connected with action. Instead of turning my life when I'm having a problem, facing a problem, instead of turning over to drunkenness and drugs, I give myself wholly to God. Faithfulness. There's meekness. That's power under control. There's temperance. That's humility and their self-control literally what paul says there is through the spirit there is a holding in and a holding on in other words i could let myself explode but i'm going to hold on there's no law against such things isn't that something? You don't have to have a law that says, be good to your neighbor. <laughs> it's the Spirit of God who does that. And in Christ, you're free to produce those fruits. Why? Because the Spirit Himself indwells your heart when you bow the knee to Christ. Let Him... Take one leg, one foot, put it in front of the other, and He will light the way and will lead you to produce fruit that will absolutely last forever. That's good news. But again, it's your call, friends. 
It's your call. It's your choice. As a church, as a pastor, I can't tell you what to do. You have your own free will. Are you going to use your base of operations, your freedom for the flesh, or to walk by the Spirit? You can make the call today on that. Let's pray. God, thank you. What a passage this is. Thank you, Lord, that you called out the Galatian people so many years ago and have called us out this morning with a message of hope and freedom and life, liberty. We're free in Christ to walk right through the parted Red Sea because of the cross, the Red Sea of sin and death. That those things don't have any power over us in Christ. Oh, but Lord, help us. Help us not to twist and turn your calling, your freedom into license and legalism in order to please our flesh. Help us, Lord, as we go throughout our daily lives to see how the flesh is at work in our own lives. And may we be aware of the cost that it brings when we go that route, biting and devouring, giving into our cravings. And Lord, help us to walk by the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we so desperately need You. As we talked about, sung about earlier in our service, we need You. And so, Lord, I I pray today that this would be a time that we commit and recommit ourselves to making the choice, to utilizing the base of operations in our minds and hearts to follow where You're leading, to recognizing the pull of the flesh, but to running away from that and running towards Your Spirit and finding how you lead us one step at a time in your light, into your will, into your way, and that the outcome of walking, taking those steps will be love and joy and peace and all of those things that take so much precedence over the ways of this world and the ways of our flesh. Help us, Lord, as we make our choice today. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a time now of decision, invitation. Uh, As we stand and sing in just a moment, John's going to lead us in an invitation song, and I'll be down here at the front. If you have a decision to make public, perhaps to say, Pastor James, I've come to unite with the church. I've come for baptism to symbolize outwardly what the Spirit has done inwardly in saving me. I've died to myself and I'm following Christ. Perhaps to come pray, I'll be down here at the front. Or if you have a more personal decision, private decision, where you are, I would invite you to utilize this time for prayer and for inviting the Spirit to guide guide my steps, step Spirit, guide my heart with wisdom and encouragement. Let's do that now. Would you stand? As we sing together, John Leitz.
to Jesus I surrender Humbly at His feet I bow Worldly pleasures all forsaken Take me Jesus, take me for our friends who take up the offering to go ahead and come forward. And let's, uh, as we take up our offering, let's be mindful of, uh, again, our Mary Hill Davis offering that we're taking up right now for state missions. Um, every, uh, our, our church goal is $2,023, uh, which should be very easy to remember for us this year. But every penny of that goes uh, into state, uh, locally funded missions activities. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have now to worship through giving of our time and our talents. We pray, Lord, that you would use every resource that's given, every, every penny multiplied for your kingdom work. And we're especially mindful of that, Lord, in our state. There are so many efforts, cooperative efforts, among Texas Baptists these days. Each very important. Each Christ-centered, gospel-focused. And so we pray that, we pray that our gifts would go a long, long way in helping these programs and ministries right here at home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give.
Thanks, John, for great worship this morning. I, I got through uh, my sermon today, and I realized that part of my Bible is falling out. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, th- I think that's a good sign. Um, right there in Galatians and Ephesians, those passages about grace, I, I, I guess have been very meaningful uh, to me over the years, so that's good. That or I've just preached on them a whole lot. Um, all right, a few announcements before we, we are dismissed today. First of all, uh, we are uh, looking to, thinking about doing a parents' night out in October and also a family movie night in October. If you're interested in helping and being a part of that, these really these kind of events really depend on volunteer availability. And so if you're available, we have sign-up sheets that are out in the foyer. And uh, if you sign up for those, we uh, will certainly be able to put those events together and uh, do those outreach events. Also, I want to remind you that during the month of September, we have uh, what we're calling our September Invite Challenge. We're inviting people to, encouraging our, our folks here to invite at least two unchurched people to uh, come worship with us on Sunday morning. Next Sunday uh, at 9.30, I'll be doing what's called a connection class. These are for folks who are, uh, have been visiting or guests. Um, who have uh, not joined our church but might be interested in learning more about our church. We'll meet next week in the CMB over in the choir room at uh, 9.30. And also, I hope you've seen something. I, I, I wanted to celebrate something because I think it's a big deal. But we have diaper changing stations in our restrooms That is a huge deal, y'all. Churches need to do that. And um, so I am so grateful. Um, I think Stan and Bob put those in this week. And and I am really grateful um, uh, that we have that. You know, it's it's the little things that make a pastor's heart really happy. And um, I I, want to just let you in on a little secret of church outreach. Um, If your bathrooms are nasty you're not going to have people come to your services. So, I mean, that's just a fact of life. So, John Hemmen does a great job. We got diaper changing stations. Our bathrooms are good. All right? So, it's the little things. It's the little things. All right, would you stand? Uh, We're going to uh, have a prayer of dismissal. And I would encourage you this week to take this message of grace, 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 and being led by the Spirit to our neighbors. Let's pray together. God, we pray now that you would lead us by your Spirit into our places of business, our grocery stores, our schools, everywhere that we go, taking the gospel of grace, living and walking by the Spirit and not the flesh. And I pray, Lord, that as we get into conversations and as people even merely see our behavior that they would say man there is something different going on with you tell me what are you doing what do you have and it would naturally open the door to a conversation about Christ and his grace we pray these things in Jesus name amen god bless you